What I thought I'd do tonight is kind of introduce things and then get into some of the early years of Crested Butte before there was a Crested Butte. So the way I'd like to start off is uh, to talk a little bit about a great poem that I have here somewhere. I'm going to put my glasses on, get a little older. And this is the way I think a lot of us kind of feel about the West and, and Crested Butte specifically. It's called The Land of Today, and it's by a fellow by the name of Arthur Chapman, who was the main writer of the Denver Post. Chapman is the guy who also was more famous for the famous phrase, out where the hand clasp is a little stronger, that's where the West begins, is a great, great, another great poem. But this is The Land of Today, and it goes like this. Out in the land where life is new and each sunrise brings its zest, where great tasks lure upon every hand and each, each road provides a quest. The strength of the hills and the calm of the plains are part of his heritage, who dwells in the west where the book of deeds turns over a thrilling page. In other lands, tradition weighs like lead on the buoyant heart, and the race is lost in many a case ere the runner has made his start. But always here it has been today, and today will ever be. And no ghosts of, of us who lived yesterday shall assert their mastery. There's always love for a land that's new, surpassing love for the old. And the carefree West with its deathless youth shall find no hearts grown cold. And so men turn as their fathers turned when adventure led the way. To the West of the gold and sky and earth, for it's always a glad today, the land of today. When I was coaching a Western State with my cross-country teams, I think I started off every day with, and I got a little older all the time when I said it, I said, it's great to be young and alive and in Colorado. And a lot of us, I think, feel the same way. We are in a town, as all of you people know, with the Elk Mountains towering off in the distance. The elevation of the town is 8,885 feet, very rugged terrain. And a long time ago, a great historian from England by the name of Arnold Toynbee said that geography is the great lever of history. And what he meant by that was that every area in the world is as it is because of geography over anything else. So the altitude, the cold weather, the heavy snow, the water and the lack of water, and the isolation have all played a great role in developing what today is Crested Butte. Toynbee used as an example Greece. Uh, Greece is a nation of 25,000 square miles, and it's one tangled mountain range after another. And it was very difficult a couple thousand years ago for people to get around from one spot to another because of the mountain ranges. And as a result, Greece developed a city-state form of government. There was never one man or one person over all of Greece. There was Athens, there was Sparta, there was Corinth, there was Delphi, one great city after another, and all were independent because you couldn't get around very well. The other example he used was England. And England is a small country, smaller than Colorado, much smaller than Colorado, and it's an island. And England could never produce all the food it needed. It could never produce everything it needed to survive as a civilization. So England developed one of the great colonial empires of all time, and that's where they got their goods from, the colonies. And they also developed one of the great navies of all time to protect their colonies. So geography led England to be England. In the year 1890, the census report of the United States said that there now were 3.9 people living per square mile in the United States. The frontier designation is two people per square mile. A young historian three years later from the University of Wisconsin, Frederick Jackson Turner, delivered a 12-page paper to the American Historical Association meeting 
and he entitled that 12-page paper, The Significance of the Frontier in American History. And I'm going to give you some of the points that Turner made, but the big question that Turner posed was, the frontier is no more. What implication does that have for the future of the United States, that the frontier no longer exists? And Turner made four points. He made a lot more than that, but four key points. Number one, he said, the, the number one thing that distinguishes an American from anybody else in the world is, or was, the presence of free land in the West. Number two, said Turner, whenever anybody was out of a job or whenever any area in the United States filled up, any person living in that area never had to resort to labor violence or revolution. All he did was go west. And Turner called that the safety valve, the safety valve thesis. Number three, said Turner, there are two things that have to happen to get large numbers of people moving from one area to another. Number one, you got to have a repelling force, something driving them out. And number two, you got to have an attracting force, something bringing them in. The repelling force was what we called in those days, in the 1800s, panics. Today we call them recessions and depressions. People are out of a job. And there appears to be no hope where they are, so they go west. And why do they go west? Because in the valley of the Puget Sound Trough or the valley of the Willamette or the San Joaquin or Sacramento Valleys of California, there is tremendous farmland. In the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and the Sierra Nevadas of California, there is gold and there is silver. In Montana, copper. In Utah, copper. In Nevada, the Comstock load. In Alaska, gold and silver. So you got the attracting force and you got the repelling force. Now, was there always, were there always riches where these people went? The answer is no. And I'll tell you a little story. Miners are the most optimistic people who ever lived. And I got a little story about that that I'll tell you. One of the great stories told in the mining camps of the United States West was that a miner died and went to heaven. And whenever that was said, that a miner died and went to heaven, everybody, every other miner heard that story, laughed. They knew no miner ever went to heaven. No miner ever went to heaven because they're gambling and they're consorting with prostitutes and they're drinking, the usual stuff in mining camps. But this miner had been very good and he went to heaven and he presented his pass to St. Peter at the Golden Gate. And St. Peter said, can't take you, we're booked. And the miner said, what the hell you mean we're booked? And St. Peter said, don't get on me, so I feel real bad about it. We had a big religious war out in the Middle East and a lot of good people died and that's it. And the miner said, I did not abstain from all these vices common in the mining camps to come up and hear you tell me I can't go into heaven. He said, I want a temporary pass. And if I can go in, convince one person to get out, I'm in. And St. Peter said, nobody has ever left heaven arbitrarily in history. And the miner said, shut up and give me the pass. And St. Peter felt bad. He said, well, nobody's coming out anyway. I do owe the guy because this is the first time that's happened that we couldn't let a guy in. So he gave the miner a temporary pass. And eight minutes later, 4,716 people streamed out of heaven and they appeared to be in a fast hurry to leave. And St. Peter grabbed the miner. And he said, my God, he said, what in the hell did you tell those people? And the miner said, what do you mean? What did I tell him? He said, I just told him a big gold strike down in hell. <laughs> and then the miner grabbed his backpack and slung it over his shoulder and headed away from heaven. And St. Peter grabbed the miner and he said, where the hell do you think you're going? 
And the miner said, what do you mean? Where do you think I'm going? He says, haven't you heard? They got a big gold strike down in hell. <laughs> the miners, ladies and gentlemen, believe their own publicity. You never had to have any assurance that there was anything there. All there had to be was a rumor. My athletes used to get frustrated with me when I was on a trip and they say, coach, why don't you buy a Colorado lottery ticket once in a while? And I said, the chances of me hitting it big on a Colorado lottery ticket are slim and none, and slim just left town. <laughs> and my athlete leaned over and he said, well, coach, he said, you know, you can't win if you don't play. <laughs> and the odds may be against you in a mining camp, but at least you're there and you got a chance. If you're not there, you got no chance. So that's where we are here in Crested Butte. The frontier is gone. And people are now going to come into Crested Butte. And we'll, we'll take a look at when they came in. Some of the early people who came in were immigrants who came in from Cornwall and Ireland and England and Scotland and Wales. And they were called Cousin Jacks and Cousin Jennies. And Crested Butte had a lot of those names in the early years with names like Ross and McNeil and Gardner. And these people had come from the best mines, the mining country in the world. By that I mean they were the best miners in the world because the Welch in particular worked in the tin mines for centuries. They knew what they were doing with regard to mining. They were Protestant. They spoke the English language. And then in the middle 1890s, people began to come into Crested Butte from southeastern Europe. Croatia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Italy, Austria. Countries later on be called Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. They were Catholic. They did not speak the English language. And they were farmers. They never worked in a mine in their life, practically. And now the twain had to meet. And it was very difficult for the twain to meet. And when I get into a lecture on some of the uh, ethnic groups in Crested Butte, you'll see that it was difficult. And I kind of identify with that. And I'm going to give you a story uh, on my own here. I grew up in a small Belgian farming community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula called St. Nicholas. And everybody, including my father and grandfather, were off the boat. They'd all gone through Ellis Island and, and made their way eventually to the Midwest. And everybody's name started with V-E-R or V-A-N. And everybody spoke Flemish or Walloon or French. Living, and we had great farms, and I still have the farm I grew up on. And right next to us, the land was a little lower. It wasn't good for farming, but the Finnish people had settled, and they worked in the woods. And the Belgians always thought they were a little better than the Finns, because maybe they had a little bit more money. And it was understood that you never, you, you know, you could associate with them, but let's not involve ourselves with dating or anything like that. Well... When I was a senior, they had a beautiful blonde Finnish girl by the name of Lucille Lund who was a cheerleader. And I took it upon myself to ask her to the prom. When my mother and father found out about that, <clears throat> they were not happy. When Lucille's mother and father found out about that, they were not happy. But the arrangement had been made and we were allowed to go to the prom. We went to the prom and we left after about 20 minutes because the tension was so great you could have cut it with a knife. It was not the thing to do. She was home by about 10 o'clock. I was home at 10.15. Today we laugh about it. And eventually that stuff ended. No more. And I'll tell you what, what solved it. Neither the groom or the lady's parents ever went to the wedding. 
and they didn't have much association with either one of the two kids. And then one day, a baby was born. And I can just hear it now because I heard my mother say it. Uh, Dad and I are coming through town and, uh, you know, we were going to drop some stuff off for Sarah. And they drop stuff off for Sarah and they get a look at that grandchild. And on the way home, the mother says to the father, the grandmother says to the grandfather, you know, it looks like he's treating her well and they're, they're doing pretty good. And now another phone call. We know you folks are both working and you're struggling, and I know it's going to be real tough duty, but uh, we'll be happy to come in and babysit little Sarah. And there's an old saying, and a little child shall, leave them, shall lead them. And that was it. It took about a six-month-old baby to bring the groups together. The adults were too stupid. Six-month-old girl was not stupid. And that's how they got together. We'll have a lecture on the ethnic groups of Crested Butte down the line. Geography. I want to say a few things about geography and tell some of you people uh, some things that you already know. There are six mountains between Crested Butte and Aspen, all over 14,000 feet, and those are the Elk Mountains. There are six great mountain ranges in Colorado that are 14,000 feet or better. Near Telluride, San Miguel Mountains, San Juan Mountains, Front Range, Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and one of the greatest mountain ranges on the North American continent going from Monarch Pass to the Mount of the Holy Cross, and that is called the Sawatch Range, with 15 mountains, 14,000 feet or better, starting with Chavano and Tabawatch and going on to the Mount of the Holy Cross. The mountains out here between here and Aspen, we all know, most of you people have climbed some of them, Castle and Capitol, Snowmass and Pyramid, and the North and South Maroon Bells. Six mountains in the Elk Range. There are other mountains, many of them lacoliths. Two weeks from today, Dr. Bartleson's coming in here. We're going to get a geology lesson with slides on the geology of the Crested Butte area. Crested Butte Mountain, 12,172. Gothic, 12,5. Axtell, 12,5. Emmons, 12,4. White Rock, 12,5. And you all wonder how they got those names. Crested Butte Mountain got its name in 1874 when a great surveyor named Ferdinand Van de Veer Hayden stood on top of Mount Tiakali and looked off in the distance and saw two great mountains and he referred to those mountains as the Crested Buttes, plural. Later on, a bunch of people living near Gothic thought that Gothic Mountain actually resembled a Gothic cathedral, looked like a Gothic cathedral. And they changed the name and it became known as Gothic Mountain. And they dropped the S from the Buttes. And that's how Crested Butte Mountain got its name, because as you can see, it resembles the crest of a Spanish helmet. That's how that one got its name. Gothic, I've already told you, Mount Axtell, named for William Axtell, a prominent businessman in Crested Butte in the 1880s. Mount Emmons, where Red Lady Basin is. Named for Samuel Emmons, one of Ferdinand Hayden's workers, one of the engineers working in the Hayden survey. White Rock Mountain, which is up Copper Creek, of course, it looks white. Tiakali, 13,208. Tiakali is an Aztec name for temple. I don't know who named it. Whetstone. Now again, i got to put my glasses on here. Everybody always asks me how Whetstone got the name. Here's a newspaper report, 1927, I'll quote it. The United States Forest Service in 1927 was looking for the origin of the name Mount Whetstone or Mount Wheatstone near Crested Butte. J.W. Hearst, Crested Butte resident for many years, said that Ferdinand Hayden, during his great survey in the 1870s, found a formation on the mountain that made good whetstones and named it Mount Whetstone. 
Others said that there was no rock suitable for whetstones on the mountain, and the correct name was Mount Wheatstone, W-H-E-A-T, which was named after Sir Charles Wheatstone, 1802-75, who was a famous English scientist. Wheatstone died while Hayden was in Colorado, and the feeling was that Hayden named the peak to honor him. However, the Hayden map of 1877 shows the mountain without any name. The United States Geological Survey sheet of the Crested Butte region has shown the mountain as Mount Wheatstone since 1889. The Forest Service was asking old-timers for help on the name. So you got two spellings of that name and two different interpretations on why it, mounted, why it might have been named Mount Wheatstone or Mount Whetstone. Carbon Peak, it's called Carbon Peak because there are great coal deposits right below it. Galena, near Schofield Pass, well Galena is a form of ore they found there. Treasure and Treasury, don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. They were hoping for a little treasure. Avery Peak, just north of Gothic. That was named for William Avery, who was a prominent early miner in Gothic. Ruby, Purple, and Owen. Well, Ruby was named for the Ruby Silver up by Lake Irwin. Purple, because the mountain does look purple when the sun hits it. And Owen, named for one of the prominent miners who existed in the great mining camp of Irwin. Major passes, Kebler, 10,007, named for J.E. Kebler, who was a railroad man. They were hoping to run the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad up Ohio Creek, a dead end at Baldwin, but they were hoping to run it right into Irwin during the boom, and then the boom ended. And you can still see the grade as you go up towards Ohio Pass on the right side of the road. Ohio Pass, named for some guy from Ohio. <laughs> Schofield, named for B.F. Schofield, the prominent guy who started the town of Schofield. West Maroon, 12-4. East Maroon, 11-8. Well, we know why it's named East and West Maroon. You can see the Maroon Bells. Pearl Pass, no idea, 12-7. Ewell Pass, 12,200 feet, named for George Ewell, who was a prominent investor in the Ewell Marble Quarries at Marble. Reno Divide, named for a guy who established a way station. As you go up Cement Creek, you go over Reno Divide and you go right into Taylor Park past the Star Mine and the Stewart Mine and they had a toll road that ran through there and you can still see some of the remains of the old barns and the cabins that were up near Reno Divide, 10,898 feet. Anthracite Pass, named for the anthracite coal. Anthracite Creek, same thing. Gunsite Pass. Well, Gunsight, there are a couple of Gunsight passes, but the one in Crested Butte, we've all been up there picking raspberries, and it kind of narrows as you go over the pass, hence the name Gunsight. Streams, East River, coming off Schofield Pass, Slate River, coming off Yule Pass, Brush Creek, coming off Pearl Pass. Crystal River, coming off Schofield Pass and going the opposite direction of the East River, going down to Crystal and Marble. Oh, be joyful. I got a great story on Oh, be joyful later on. Oh, be joyful and Poverty Gulch aren't very far from each other. The interesting thing is that Oh, be joyful never turned out anything and Poverty Gulch turned out a lot. Coal Creek, pretty obvious, and Anthracite Creek, pretty obvious. Mineral resources of the area. Gold, more about that in a moment. Silver, more about that in a moment. Molybdenum, 
Mount Emmons is full of it. Coal, that's what made this town. And marble, those are all the great things that came out of the mines in the north part of this area around Crested Butte. Some of the first people ever to come into this area outside of the Ute Indians. In fact, I'll go ahead to the Utes first, and then we'll come by over to the Spanish. We believe today that in the state of Colorado, in what today is the state of Colorado, there were 5,000 Ute Indians, and 2,500 of them lived in the Gunnison country in the summer. And when you look at the Ute Indian population, there is one group of Indians that are a separate tribe. They live up in northwestern Colorado, near Meeker, and those people are known as the White River Ute Indians. You got another group of Ute Indians that lived in the southern part of the state, near Pagosa Springs and Toy Walk and Cortez, and those are known as the Southern Utes. And a third group of Ute Indians who lived in the Gunnison country in the summertime and were smart enough to get out to the Uncompagre Valley from Montrose to Delta to Grand Junction in the wintertime are called the Uncompagre Utes. And the word Uncompagre is a Ute Indian term that means red, hot, stinking water. Red for the sandstone cliffs at Uray, hot for the hot springs at Uray, and stinking because of the sulfur smell coming out of the hot springs. So the Ute Indians, we know that they were here as early as 1598, and they were here obviously earlier than that, but that's just the first time that anybody saw them. Juan Oñate, coming up from Mexico City, trying to set up a northern post for the Spanish, ran into them. We know that the Ute Indians got horses as early as 1626. And when they got horses, they became a tremendous adversary. The Ute Indians were moved out of the San Luis Valley in 1863. Who the hell did they think they were living on good farming and ranch land that an industrious white man could use? In 1868, they are moved into western Colorado, the western part of western Colorado, beyond the 107th meridian, running from Steamboat Springs to Pagosa Springs and running four miles west of Crested Butte. There's where the line was. Ute Indians are west of that line. And that's why we got the White River Agency up on the White River, northwestern Colorado. Now when I show my class, they don't have a map here to show you, but you imagine Colorado was a rectangle. When I show my class, I draw the line, and then I put the dot on the east side of the line, and they say, Vannebush, you're starting to lose it again. The Indians are supposed to be west of the 107th meridian. You just said that. Well, here's what happened. Lieutenant Calvin J. Spear was moving the Indians down to Los Pinos near Durango. And when they got near Cochito Pass, the Indians who far outnumbered the white men, the white army that was with Spear, you had a small contingent, they said, we're not going any further. If you try to make us, we'll have a fight right here, and it's probably not going to come out good for you guys because we outnumber you. So Spear said, discretion's the better part of valor, and he located the Indian agency east of the line where it wasn't supposed to be. And to make sure that all these hot shots in Washington, D.C. recognized it, he named the creek Los Pinos Creek. And everybody in Washington, D.C. and the federal government looked at it and said, well, that's right, yeah, Los Pinos Creek must be the right spot. But the damn thing was never, ever on the reservation. It was off the reservation. As part of that 1868 treaty, a cow camp was established at Dos Rios, right where the 13th green is on the present Dos Rios golf course. It opened up in 1868. Now, I always, and I, I'm sorry Rosman is here, because I've got to tell him this. 1,160 sheep and 640 cows. 
and they grazed in the Gunnison country. And then the Indians would be allowed to come in from Los Pinos in the summer and shoot them just like they did with bow and arrows when the white man wasn't around. Riding into the cow camp on Christmas Day of 1872 in a blizzard was one of the great men in the history of the Gunnison country named Alonzo Hartman, and he took over the cow camp. So today, anybody going to ride at Hartman Rocks, that's where Alonzo Hartman's ranch was, right below the rocks, right where the golf course is today. And then, in 1875, tremendous silver and gold was discovered in the San Juan Mountains, and the Indians were moved out. Another treaty, Treaty of 1873, getting them out of the San Juan, but now, two years later, the Indians are moved. And as you drive today from Montrose going towards Uray and Ridgeway, 12 miles out of Montrose on Highway 550 on the right side of the road, 12 miles away, there is a little convenience store and a gas station, and the sign says, Kelowna. That was the reservation in 1875. Four miles before that was Fort Crawford, where Colonel Reynold McKenzie had a military contingent to make sure the Indians weren't going to cause any trouble. On June the 7th, 1881, the Indians are moved out of Colorado primarily because of the Meeker Massacre in the northern part of the state, where an Indian agent who was kind of an idiot named Nathan Meeker was massacred along with 11 of his agency employees, and the whites used this as a way to get the Indians out. And on June the 7th in 1881, the Indians crossed the Colorado River and went into Utah. And now the whole area, including the Gunnison country, was open for white miners and white ranchers and white farmers. One of the great miners of Irwin was a guy named Harry Cornwall. And I got in my hand right here 64 pages of memoirs that Harry Cornwall wrote in New York. He was a member of Wall Street later on about his days in Irwin and the Gunnison country. And with your indulgence, I'm going to read you some revealing things about what happened here in 1879 and 1880. Quote, this is after the Meeker Massacre. The youths were probably the laziest tribe of Indians in the country. They did nothing in the way of work. Many Indians have some specialty that they manufacture, such as baskets, blankets, or pottery, but the youths did nothing. They didn't even hunt for meat regularly, although the reservation abounded in game. Every fall, they usually have a grand hunt when they killed a good many deer. But as a steady diet, they preferred the beef, pork, and flour that the government served out to them. Every fall, the lordly bucks would go out and shoot a lot of deer and then go back to the agencies, leaving to the squaws the task of skinning the deer, bringing the meat back to camp, and tanning the hides. But this was only the annual event. So the women did most of the work. Not much has changed today. Ruby Camp, Irwin, was about 100 miles in a direct line from the scene of the outbreak, the Meeker Massacre, and we saw nothing of the actual trouble, but we certainly imagined a large number of massacres. I had always heard of the brold frontiersman and had pictured him as a man without fear and with the most supreme contempt for Indians. My experience in Ruby Camp and elsewhere, not only in connection with the Ute outbreak, but on other occasions, entirely changed my views. The old original frontiersmen who crossed the plains in the early days before the railroads were built must have been brave. But the later ones in my day were a lot of Confederates. There were, of course, exceptions. But a large majority of the men at Ruby were as cowardly as rats and ran like rats when the news of the Meeker massacre reached us. There were probably 500 men in camp or in the district when we heard of the trouble. All were armed. A miners' meeting was called, and we begged the men all to stay, because with 500 men and 500 guns, we could stand off all the Utes on the reservation. 
In spite of all our arguments, at least 450 men ran out of the country. Some were so scared that they couldn't even tie a pack on a horse. To my mind, individual courage is largely a matter of pride. I was probably one of the most frightened persons in camp, but I was too proud to show it, so I stayed. George, his brother, as I remember, was in Denver at the time and was not in camp at all during the excitement. We had in camp a man named Curtis, who had been an Indian agent, scout, and interpreter for many years. He was brave. We organized for mutual protection and elected Curtis our commander with the title of captain. His first act as captain was to send a messenger to the nearest telegraph office, 80 or more miles away, with a message to the governor of Colorado offering the services of the Ruby Scouts in the campaign against the Utes. This was without any knowledge on our part and without consulting anyone. In fact, there were no Ruby Scouts. Curtis originated the name in his message. It was a clever piece of advertising for Curtis, and we talked seriously of lynching him as a token of our appreciation. If the governor had accepted his offer, I think we would have lynched him. None of us were looking for Indians or wanted any fighting. All he wanted to do was to be let alone. We built a large log cabin surrounded by a stockade, and for several nights everybody slept outside with sentinels out. But after a few nights, we deserted the big cabin for our more comfortable ones and trusted to luck. We had arranged that three shots in quick succession meant Indians and was a call to arms and to gather at the stockade. Early one morning, Jim Young went out from camp down the gulch to look for his horse, which had been hobbled and turned out to graze. Only a short distance below the camp, he ran against, uh, across a big she silver tip bear whose cub had been shot the day before and it was very ugly. She charged Young and he fired three rapid shots before he killed her. We all heard the shots, grabbed our guns and rushed to the stockade in all sorts of undress apparel. When Young returned in pride with the bearskin two hours later, he was received with scowls for disturbing our beauty sleep with a false alarm. Well, we could go on and on with this, but enough, enough said. So the Ute Indians, the philology of the Ute Indians still exists today in the Gunnison country. For instance, Tamichi, Chavano, Juanita, Saponero, Curacanti, Uray, Chapita Falls, Signal Peak, and Cochetope. All Indian names. But now, by 1880, the Indians are out of here, and the Gunnison country is now ready to open. Robert Strayhorn, who wrote a book called 15 Miles, 15,000 Miles by Stage with his wife Carrie, had come into the Gunnison country very early, said, quote, the rifle went hand in hand with the shovel and the skeletons often exhumed in those days of peace indicate many a thrilling chapter of unwritten history. So you got Indians and you're trespassing with the Indians. Now we come to the placer miners. I've already told you the story of the optimism of the placer miners in how the West was won. Debbie Reynolds, who still has a house near Ridgeway, and as everybody I've talked to says she's a hell of a girl, hell of a woman, sang this song that I just heard again today on YouTube. And I had to listen to it about eight times so I get all the words down. I had some of them. And here's what she said with regard to the miners. What was your name in the States? Was it Thompson, Johnson, or Gates? Did you happen to draw on your mother-in-law or sink the old lady with weights? Or what was your name in the States? Was it Murphy, McDonald, or Yates? Did you hold up a bank in a juvenile prank and pack up the money in crates? What was your name in the States? You must have some honest traits. Did you try to abscond with a beautiful blonde? Such minor offenses we tolerate. What was your name in the East? 
And how recently was you deceased? Are you riding the rails because you held up the male, or was it the female you held, you beast? What was your name in New York? Clancy or Toole or York? Are you wanted for life for leaving your wife when she caught you sniffing a cork? What was your name in the States, though you suffered the cruelest of fates? Well, out here in the West, everything is a yes, so line up and fill up your plate, my friend. Oh, what was your name in the States? When you were in the States, nobody asked where you came from, where you been, what are you doing here? Those are fighting words. And it'd be like me going up to a rancher here like Rosman was and saying to Rosman, how many cattle you're running? <laughs> That'd be like saying how much money you got in the bank or how much you got in the stock market. You don't say that kind of stuff out here in the West. The Spanish came after the Ute Indians. Now, when I always talk about the Spanish, I say this. We don't know a whole lot about Spain and the Gunnison country, although we know that they were in here in pretty good numbers. But the problem is that almost all of the expeditions into the Gunnison country were illegal. And they were illegal because if they were legal, anything that you found, you had to give a good portion to the crown. So you kept your mouth shut and you went out on illegal expeditions. Original name of the Gunnison River, Rio de la San Xavier. Gold found near Cochito Pass, 1598. All kinds of old remnants from Spain in the Gunnison country. But we'll never know about it unless we go to Mexico City's archives or Spain's archives in Madrid and we can speak Spanish, and we know all the old local names. It's there. It's probably never going to be found. Now we come, and we got a little litany of people coming in. Number one people, Ute Indians. Following the Ute Indians come the Spanish. And following the Spanish, starting around 1849, come the placer miners. Now just so we know what we're talking about here, there are two types of mining. One is placer mining, one is load mining, or quartz mining, or hard rock mining. Placer mining, all of you know. And that is an individual with a gold pan scooping up a bunch of debris out of the East River, out of the Slate River, Washington Gulch, gently rotating dirt with water in the pan, water running out of the pan, all the light dirt running out of the pan. What is left in the bottom of the pan are stones and black sand, if you're lucky. That's gold. Too heavy to go out of the pan. With forceps, you take the rocks out. And then you pour a little mercury in the gold pan which amalgamates or links on with gold. And then you burn the mercury off. And what you have in the bottom of the pan is always known as pay dirt. The dirt on the bottom of the pan that pays. Now, if you want to use mass production techniques with placer mining, you use a sluice box, which is a wooden trough with six inch high boards on the side you got a head box here, you dump debris in the head box, you run water through the sluice box. On the bottom of the sluice box, you've got burlap, and you got little metal clegs where the gold is caught. If you want to further engage in mass production, you build a long tom. And a long tom is a 30-foot long sluice box with a bigger head box and more guys working the long tom. Two very destructive ways of mining. Fortunately, not in the Gunnison country. But one of them, you can still see the remains out by Fair Play today. As you drive through Fair Play today, you see those big gravel, a bunch of gravel on the side of the branch of the Platte River. 
Everybody says, what the hell is all that gravel about? Well, up until the middle 1970s, they had a dredge there on the branch of the Platte River. And a dredge is a floating mill that goes down the middle of a stream bed. If you got gold out of black sand just on the bottom of that stream bed, it's pretty obvious that you got gold maybe 10, 15 feet below. And it digs up the hell out of that bottom of the stream bed and kicks off the, all the excess off to the side. That's why you got all that gravel. That's one very bad method of mining. The other one is called hydraulic mining. And hydraulic mining, primarily used in California, but occasionally in Colorado, involved running a hose out of a lake or a stream way up above, and that hose goes into a tripod attachment, and you got in California, they got them eight feet long, they got like a cannon suspended on that tripod. And water coming downhill creates great pressure. And water coming downhill goes through that cannon and is shot at high pressure right up against the side of a hill where you think there might be gold. In some places in California, like Jackson Diggings, it looks like the damn moon. Very, very bad environmental way of doing it. So here are the placer miners. We know today that some of the placer miners came through Taylor Park as early as 1849 on their way to California. They did find gold in Colorado, but they didn't find enough to dissuade them from one of the greatest gold rushes in history. And that was the California Gold Rush. That was one of the great granddaddies of them all. But a lot of them made a little mental note as they went through what later on to be called Colorado, and they said, you know, if that strike plays out in California, we might come back here. In the year 1861, a Methodist missionary by the name of John Franklin Dyer left California Gulch. California Gulch today is Leadville, and it's so typical of what would happen in the Gunnison country. As you go into Leadville, coming from the south to the north, and you look off to the right, you see a kind of a high ridge. It doesn't even look like a mountain range. On the left side of the road, you got the Sawatch Range, Mount Elbert and Massive and Harvard and so on. And coming off of that range there, that is the Mosquito Mountains with Mosquito Pass, the second highest pass in the state of Colorado. And coming off those mountains from the east to the west are gulches. California Gulch, Iowa Gulch, Georgia Gulch, Stray Horse Gulch, Evans Gulch, and they all run into the Arkansas River. And any miner worth his salt knows that any time you got ravines or gulches like that coming off the top of a mountain range, you're washing gold down with it. Father Dyer left Leadville and came over Lake Pass in 1861. Lake Pass is at the north end of Taylor Park. And he came into the park and he saw 100 guys placer mining at Kent's Gulch, 1861, trespassing on Ute land. Hopefully some of you get out into that area. From there, Father Dyer made his way to Spring Creek. And at Spring Creek, he hung a right-hand turn up a gulch, heading for Cement Creek. And about a mile up the gulch, he saw the bleaching bones of seven miners who had been killed by Indians the previous year, and bleaching bones of horses that had also been shot. The miners fought for three days, were all killed. And Father Dyer appropriately named the area Dead Man's Gulch. Now in that area, for some of you mountain bikers, as you come up Dead Man's Gulch and going towards Cement Creek, there's a little left-hand fork right up the uh, way that goes up Rosebud. And from Rosebud, you go on a beautiful trail, so beautiful that all the locals, including me, call it Julie Andrews. 
and takes it right to the head of Dead Man's Gulch. And then Father Dyer had a hell of a time getting down to Cement Creek. Because today, if you want to get down to Cement Creek on your mountain bike, 37 switchbacks down to Cement Creek. I can make all but three. A couple of them scare the hell out of me, though. <laughs> now you're at Cement Creek, down Cement Creek, into the East River Valley, right past where Crested Butte is today, seven miles up Washington Gulch, where he preaches to 200 men at Minersville, right where Elkton is today. 200 miners working at Washington Gulch. 100, Kent Gulch and Taylor Park. Jim Taylor would soon come into the park that same year. Fred Lottis, Lottis Creek, Taylor Park, Snowblind Gulch, Armstrong Gulch, 12 guys killed by Schofield at the headwaters of the Crystal River and the East River. So all these guys are trespassing as they engage in placer mining around Crested Butte. The placer mining era ended about 1869, and it ended for a variety of reasons. Number one, most of the gold had been taken out. Most of the easy gold had been taken out. Number two, the area had become very dangerous for the miners. The Ute Indians increasingly were not very enchanted with these white guys trespassing on their land, and there appeared to be more of them coming. The third reason was the seasons were so short. Anybody imagine the famous comment of Ezekiel Williams, a fur trapper in the Gunnison country, who later on retired and went back to Missouri. And he said that the fur trapping wasn't very good in, wasn't the Gunnison country then, but in what the Gunnison country is today because he said, quote, the rivers was froze up too much of the year, unquote. So it's a hell of a thing to get supplies in, and the first time you could probably get in there be like about May or June. You're not driving over Monarch Pass, you know. And then around October, November, you know, you start to get snow and things kind of shut down. And then the last thing that happened was in the middle 1860s, early and middle 1860s, the Civil War started. Jim Taylor went off to fight for the South and never returned, died in Arizona. He named an area Rebel Gulch. Fred Lottis went off to fight for the North. And Lottis Creek is in the area. Fred Lottis, ladies and gentlemen, took $5,000 worth of gold out of the diggings at Lottis Creek. You can still see the diggings. Anybody been up Lottis Creek as it goes near the Union Park cow camp? Right, you can still see the diggings. Five grand a year. Now here's what I'll tell you about that. At 20 an ounce. Today on the New York Stock Exchange, give or take, gold sells at $1,250 an ounce. By today's standards, 65 or 62 times more valuable than it was then. 62 times 5,000. Took about $310,000 out every summer. Sold his mine in 1885 for $55,000. That's a king's ransom at that time. In 1900, as Fred Lottis was going back into the park from Ohio Creek, Dutch Flats, as he had done 40 years, almost 40 years before, he collapsed and froze to death. Right where he had come in 40 years earlier. I believe that approximately one million dollars was taken out by placer miners in the Gunnison country, including most of it from Crested Butte, times 62 by today's prices, right? That's a pretty good amount of money coming out of here as placer miners. 
Now we go, we got the placer miners taken care of, and now we got explorers going through this country. And I'll just mention a couple of them. One guy coming through over Cochito Pass, 1842, the great missionary, Presbyterian missionary Marcus Whitman from Oregon. He's going out to Washington, D.C., see if Oregon to become a state. Had a hell of a time going over Cochito Pass. Going through in 1853 is John Gunnison, winding up getting killed by Paiute Indians. Some evidence, recent evidence today, says that Mormons were involved in 1853 in southern Utah. And also coming through in 1853 is the great John C. Fremont, who made five trips to the West. All of these guys are looking for a railroad route through Colorado. The U.S. government, as the Secretary of War, is Jefferson Davis. We all heard of that name? 1853, $150,000 for four surveys for railroads in the West. Jefferson Davis later on becomes the head of the Confederacy in the Civil War. One guy goes north, Isaac Stevens. One guy goes south, Billy Park, New Orleans to San Diego. One guy, I, I love this name, is a South Central route from Memphis to Los Angeles, and his name is Emil Whipple. And one of the greatest ads in history, maybe the greatest, featured Mr. Whipple. Anybody remember that ad? What was Mr. Whipple accused of doing? Squeezing the Charmin. The bastard was squeezing the Charmin. And on top of that, there was a rumor that he also was squeezing Mrs. Butterworth. <laughs> the other ad, the, I'm going to tell you the other ad, the other ad, for all you financial people in here, E.F. Hutton, E.F. Hutton. Big cafe, outdoor cafe, you're all sitting around these tables. Everybody is talking, music is playing. One guy sitting to a, next to another guy, and one guy says to the other guy, yeah, my broker says such and such. He said, what does your broker say? And the other guy says, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and E.F. Hutton says, and as soon as he says that, you can hear a pin drop. Everybody leans in to hear what E.F. Hutton had to say. Two greatest ads I've ever seen. <laughs> Mr. Whipple, number one, E.F. Hutton, number two. And then the fourth great one, fourth great trip, trying for a railroad is John Gunnison. It's the Transcontinental Railroad is not going through the Gunnison country. Mountains are too high, there's no good low pass, there's a damn black canyon, there's son of a bitch hill running from Blue Mesa Summit and, Blue, and uh, Cerro Summit, it's very rough. So it's not going to happen. Then come the great surveys of the American West, and will feature Crested Butte. Guys like Stephen Long and Zebulon Pike and Lewis and Clark had looked at the West, but they had only gone through. I mean, Lewis and Clark spent one day maybe near Bismarck, North Dakota, kept right on going. Zebulon Pike spent one day near Salida and kept on going. We now needed somebody to take the first scientific look at what existed in the West. And we had to eliminate some of these ridiculous rumors of a wild river going through a steep canyon that nobody had ever gone through before. Everybody knew that was a lie. <laughs> Indians living in canyons, three to four hundred at a shot with buildings built out of stone and everybody knew that was a lie. Hot water bubbling out of the ground a hundred feet high somewhere out in the west, and everybody said, that's a bunch of nonsense. So here came the four great surveyors of the American West, 1867 to 1879. One of them was John Wesley Powell, first guy to go down the Colorado River, one-armed guy, lost one arm in the Civil War, 1867 and then again in 1869. 
But Powell is much more famous for two other things that he did. In 1877, he wrote a report called a Report on the Arid Regions of the West. No man in history ever understood the West before or after better than John Wesley Powell. And Powell said this about the West. Number one, he said, there is not plenty more where that comes from. We better conserve our water and our land and our timber and everything else. First conservationist. Secondly, he said, the natural way of making a living in the West is by ranching. Because there's not enough water for farming. 13 million buffalo have grazed out in the Great Plains and they made it. Cows can do the same thing. Number three, if you have to farm, you better have access to irrigation. Because dry farming probably isn't going to cut it. And the Homestead Act giving you 160 acres is ridiculous. You're lucky to run one cow on 160 acres out in the West. And number four, said John Wesley Powell, and most importantly, there is only one entity that is big enough to finance gigantic irrigation projects and reservoirs needed to people the West and to have farmers and ranchers succeed, and that is the federal government. And the federal government was looked upon as a friend in those days. Paid for Indian protection, subsidized railroads, built reservoirs, subsidized stagecoaches, set the price of gold and silver high enough so miners could make it. So I want to tell you right now, I'm going to give a hip, hip, hooray. Let's hip, hip, hooray for the federal government. Hip, hip. Hooray. Well, it was muted. It was half-hearted. And everybody looks at me and they said, Bannon Bush, you're losing it, buddy. What the hell do you mean, hip, hip, hooray for the federal government? But I'm going to tell you right now, people, there's only one difference between the federal government then and the federal government today. And that is we got a hell of a lot more people in the country than we did then. And everybody wants a piece of the action, right? Did ranchers have to worry about mountain bikers back in 1875? <laughs> hell no. Did they have to worry about 20,000 boats on the Taylor River every summer? No. Federal government now, you talk to fishermen and they say, we don't want any damn rapids, we want to catch fish. Mark Schumacher and the boys uh, at Scenic River says, let that water out of the dam, we want that water high so our people can get a good ride. Well, the federal government can't be all things to all people. John Wesley Powell became known as the father of government bureaus. Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Mines, Soil Conservation Service. For the, all of those federal agencies, big impact on the West. 79% of the Gunnison country is owned by the federal government. 93% of Nevada owned by the federal government. 40% of the land in Colorado owned by the federal government. I submit to you that if you own that kind of real estate, you're probably going to make some decisions. And the other thing that was famous about Powell is he's the second head of what today is known as the United States Geological Survey, another federal bureau. Second great surveyor. Ferdinand van de Veer Hayden. He's the guy who found all the coal deposits, marble deposits, silver deposits. He's the guy on top of Mount Tiacali naming Crested Butte. Third guy, George Wheeler. George Wheeler had a guy working for him named William Marshall. Had a hell of a toothache. And Marshall was searching for a way to get from Santa Fe to Denver a lot faster so he could get to a dentist. And he remembered a low depression in the mountains. And he went over a pass today that bears his name. So if you don't go over Monarch Pass, and you only do this in the summer, and you turn right at Poncha Springs, 
You go over Marshall Pass, or turn right at Sargent's, and you go over Marshall Pass and come right down into Poncha Springs, and that is the pass that the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad used to enter the Gunnison country. Parallel pass to Monarch Pass. And the last guy, the last great surveyor, is a guy named Clarence Rivers King. And Clarence Rivers King exposed a diamond hoax in northwestern Colorado and was probably known best as the first head of the United States Geological Survey. Didn't like sitting at a desk, gave it up after a year, and Powell took over. That's enough for the first day. Next time we come in here, we are going to take a look at load mining and the start of coal mining in Crested Butte. Are there any questions? What is the origin of the word placer? Placer, well a placer means, a placer is the side of a stream bed. So if you're placer mining, you're mining the side of a stream bed. Any other questions? Now the people who came in late, Glow and uh, a few others need to see me. Roz, I need to see you. <laughs> Folks, it's great to have you. Thank you very much. We'll see you sharp next Monday. We're out of here.